The Skeleton by Scott Godfrey, read by Bill Oxley. My name is John. I am 34. I am married. I am going mad. I am going to kill my wife. I need you to understand why. I don't know when it started for me. I don't have an exact moment when it began. There are dreams sometimes when I was small, watching my parents flicker into and out of something. We had a small house, white picket fence, two bedrooms, and I'd listen to them, doing things in the dark. I had this terrible dream. Perhaps, yes, perhaps it was when I first came across the idea, but I can't be sure. Like I said, I don't really know, but the dream is of them, these rough giants, and suddenly my father's face peers close and the skin bleeds away, becomes like taunt paper broken in several spots, and the more I look, the more it bleeds. Suddenly, I'm staring at red flesh and my father's eyes peering out from it, and I'm screaming, and he doesn't know why. And I turn to my mother, and her face seems broken, a deeper shade of red, as I watch each blood vessel on her face pulse. Sometimes this dream and the other one come together, and I'm standing in their doorway, watching them beneath the sheets as their faces flicker from living bodies to red pulp and back, faster and faster. Sometimes the dreams come together. As I grew older, I began a study of skeletons. I knew each bone in my face, fearful lest I look to a mirror and see just white teeth and hollow eyes staring back. You see, as time passed, the flesh dissolved. First I'd watch the children I knew melt like ice in the sun, leaving their skins hanging along the ground till only the pulp under the skin remained, and they'd laugh at me as I turned and ran away, but gradually more and more dissolved. I'd watch blood vessels stream behind the girls I liked like scarlet threads, and whenever one of them would get close and the scent of the car turned from leather to skin, I'd watch as her face peeled away and blood vessels hung from her jaw till I couldn't look away and closed my eyes inside my mind, hoping somehow not to see. It's strange to imagine a decade passing, go from a child to a young man, go from watching children call curses on you, to groping and being groped by women in the back seats of cars. The only consistency in my life was watching the people I knew fall apart. And my parents died. I met my wife eventually, and I steeled myself as she crossed the aisle, bloody and raw, and the nerves I felt everyone assumed came from the normal concerns of a young man. I suppose in a way that was true, if every young man had the same fears I did. How was I ever wed? Looking back, I can't tell or explain. I was charming when I needed to be. In her company, I said perfect things. I knew her love of flowers were to touch her skin spoke of children she wanted I never wanted to have. So we were wed. I never spoke to anyone of the dreams. I didn't want to be considered a monster after all. But when I was 34, things came to a head, and I finally understood what had been happening to me. I felt the impact before I knew what happened. I was driving home from work, and a car crashed sideways into my own. I gazed at a sky black like human fat and felt my left arm shatter and noticed casually as the metal warped and burst. I knew I was going to die. I felt the blood ooze out from myself and then gazed upward at the mirror as a grinning smile of white teeth spoke to me. I heard my own teeth calling to me. I could not be mistaken. I heard a strange whispering sound and then noticed my skull in reflection. It jerked forward and I did the same. Gazing down, I noticed as my legs stiffened and then my broken arm reached to the door and pushed as I screamed. My ribs felt them push, each one suddenly flexible as a snake, as my seat belt was cut. My ribs had pushed through my own skin, severing the seat belt, and with my broken arm piercing the door open, my legs, acting on their own volition, swaggered outward to the street. And I heard my teeth calling for help, using my own voice, as I realized they were also speaking to me. And then I passed out from the pain, but as I heard later, I kept walking until I reached the sidewalk and only then collapsed. Later at the hospital, doctors fixed my arm and ribs. I was suspended in limbo, half mad from the pain, unconscious, but still able to listen as they spoke.
My bones knew I could hear them, but I always must have been able to perceive them in a way. I glanced inward to see my skull reflecting upon the situation they were in. Each portion of my skeleton was part of some parliament acting in concert, but I never noticed it. We never notice it. We never notice when our actions seem not our own, for that is them, twisting our muscles, acting as if we chose it when it was always them there below. In my unconsciousness, I must have imagined what was happening and what they were. As I awoke to see my wife's smiling face, I could only see her bones. Nothing else of her was left. I even heard my skeleton whispering something to her own. So that was when I planned on killing her. I planned it because they pushed me to it, to her. And what did I know about her? She was tall and lovely and attractive, an architect, good with children. Ah, children. That was what they were after with me and her. And nothing else. Half the time, I even forgot her name. And now her face had become quite invisible to me. I plotted in secret. A gun or a knife, and my bones would know. But closing my eyes a moment, I reached for rat killer in my garden shed after having placed a cup of flour there. They imagined I was holding flour. I poured it into her cup of coffee, placed it back, opened my eyes, fixing them out upon the flour, and went across the lawn to our home. I crossed the threshold, imagining suddenly this house was the same as when I was a small child. I crossed the rooms to where she was, and she smiled a grinning skull of a smile, and I passed the cup to her, and she was about to drink it when something stopped her. I noticed her arm stiffen, and the bones in her arm peer up at me with yellow eyes of marrow. It knew, and now they knew, and now my own skeleton stiffened to attention. Are you all right, dear? she asked. I'm fine, my teeth said and I walked outside of the room, my every instinct being to wrap my hands about her throat, and then I heard my skeleton speaking in concert against my soul. The skeleton in my mind innocently said that if I tried such a thing again, I would be gone. And I felt a small flicker of bone press against my brain, and, staring at the mirror just before the threshold leading to the outside, watched as the top of my skull collapsed downward, just enough to prove what they could do. Then I went back to my wife and sat, and they talked with the skeleton she was, and that was all. That was everything. I'm writing this to you because you have to understand. We have to fight them somehow, rip the bones out of us in order to be free. But since I can't live with myself, I am going to kill her. Or rather, I am going to try. And the moment I do, moment I attempt to put hands around her neck or drop arsenic into her coffee, my skull will collapse upon me like a ruined palace, and I will die, only to have my body live on like a puppet manipulated by them as my teeth whisper to my wife, I love you. And, assuming she still lives, she will whisper the same thing back to a man who never loved her. And assuming she is dead, Assuming she is nothing more than a suspended mannequin like myself, they will be nothing but a pair of skeletons whispering in the dark for no one else to hear but themselves. The End